further ado, let me introduce Professor Stephen Heppel. Mr. Heppel is a well-known figure in the educational sector. He has been for long working for the inclusion of technologies. And furthermore, he lives in a ship, in a boat. And that would be quite enough to deal a few minutes about the other. I'm sure he'll tell us more about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, buenos dias. Um, I do live on a boat. Uh, let's take a moment to look at a picture. Uh, and um, here, here she is. Uh, I was there yesterday. Um, this time of the year, it's uh, tied up right in the middle of London. Actually, it's quite interesting. If I, if I look at the boat, it's uh, 108 years old. I was telling some children in school about her. They said, did you buy a new? <laughs> I'm not that old. Um, but essentially, she doesn't look very different to boats today. And if I look at maybe my first mobile device, um, which is here, it was quite big. <laughs> and there was a tiny screen and uh, it only did phone calls, so it's changed a lot. And <clears throat> I was sorry, I'm a sip of water. I was re really pleased to hear the good words from your your minister earlier. Um, although I always worry when they go, but um, I was pleased to hear the good words from your minister about how together you're exploring where the future goes with the students, with the parents, with the, I, I'm a parent, I have, um, I only have three children, I feel not enough now, there should be more. I always said we should have more, but I do have three grandchildren as well, so I have a six, six is enough, I think. Um, and when I look at the pace of change, um, you know, I think we've done quite well, you know, the. You know the statistics here, when my eldest daughter, who is now a teacher, of course, all my, both my daughters teach, um, of course, uh, when she was 11, I was, I made a note of all the computer equipment in her school, and then when she was 21, I noted that the phone in her pocket was greater than the entire school computing network um, 10 years before. And that holds pretty true. I think every, every school's entire computing capability disappears into the pocket of one child every 10 years. And it's hard to keep pace with all that. You know, you're, you're talking about the adoption, formal adoption of, of um, phones in the class. If you go into Tallinn in East Europe, you'll find the preschool children have to have a smartphone to be able to start at three or four. Um, I have PhD students who are working with children. Tom Stacy, I was funny enough, I was just swapping texts with as I sat there. Um, Tom is looking at programming for four year olds, of course, on pocketable devices, and he now wishes he's nearly at the end of his PhD. He wishes he'd done programming for three year olds because four year olds are pretty easy. Um, and just when you think you're on top of the pace of change, everything changes, and that really is a good starting point for us today. Here's a, here's a shocking slide, really, to start us off. <clears throat> and I don't think any of us anticipated this. Five or ten years ago, there in the bottom corner, you can see that's the, um, that's the graph of um, terrorist attacks on schools world, worldwide. You can see it goes along pretty slowly. Some crazy American teenagers, some strange people in Europe, elsewhere, but n not very often and not very serious. Suddenly, um, and you, you've seen the headlines from Pakistan, 141 children in an examination room sat together. Three terrorists with only Kalashnikovs killed a huge numbers, or in northeast Nigeria, uh, hundreds of girls kidnapped from school, never to be seen again. And I think 
None of us expected this. So I just want you to, <clears throat> to park that at the back of your mind because you actually know that the schools of tomorrow will have to be very different from the schools of today for most of the world. Uh, in Europe, we're wealthy, we're lucky. We can maybe protect our schools, perhaps. I haven't been able to do so in America, but uh, maybe we can. But certainly in Africa, in India, in great swathes of China, in the Pacific Rim, that won't be the case. And that means a huge change. It means that children working together will be working together through devices other than face-to-face, real-time, sometimes. And that means that while we have the largesse, the wealth, the opportunity that we have in Europe, I mean, our teacher ratios here are very good, and thank goodness, uh, I think in, in England, we're about 19 to 1, teacher to student. That doesn't mean our class sizes are that small. Of course, we, we have plenty of teachers not teaching, but um, you know, the UN's target for schools around the world is 40 to 1. That's an aspirational number for somewhere in the 2020s. So we're very lucky. I just would ask you to think during this hour we have together what we will do with our largesse. Well, of course, we will make learning better with our students. I mean, that's why did we come into teaching to do that? What does it say on our shirts? It says we're here for the outcome, not for the income. This is what we care about, of course. But beyond that, how can we help the world? Beyond that, can we mend the world with learning? I believe we can. And if we can, if we're going to mend the world with learning, how might we do it? What will the tools be? What are the opportunities? What's the urgency? And really, that's what I wanted to reflect on today with you. Let's start here. Let's start. Um, this was um, a request from from uh, my government in, in Whitehall in England. And uh, I'm not expecting you would read the small print here. Hideous. Um, but they, they asked me um, this simple question. They said, Stephen, uh, and I have their trust. I've been a professor of 26 years. I was once a very young professor. You know, I've seen, the, well, we put computers into schools for the very first time. We put video discs into schools for the very first time. We put multimedia, CD-ROMs, goodness knows what. I mean, my, now, you know, we're, we're wearing glasses with screens in, you know, the, the pace of change is, is accelerating, but the challenge of harnessing technology to make learning better, bringing on board our teachers, our children, our parents, that never changes. But they knew as a government they weren't doing well enough and they weren't going quickly enough. So they said, Stephen, can you do this? And this is an interesting challenge. This was three ministers, our Minister for Schools, for Education, our Ministers for Higher Education, for universities and beyond, and our Minister for Industry. So they all said, how can we make our teachers and learners more powerful? How can we use the smart new devices that are in all our pockets, you know, in Cameroon, more children have smartphones and toilets. An interesting reflection. How can we harness the devices in all our pockets <clears throat> to make learning deeper and faster? Well, you can imagine we had a conversation about what deeper and faster meant. What is better learning? But also they said, and they said it so often, I thought they must mean it. They said, by the way, Stephen, it needs to be fun. All three of those ministers were parents. All three of them had children who would come home from school at the end of the day and say, it's really boring. I mean, sort it out, Dad. You're in charge, you know. Do something. And, uh, and these ministers listen. Um, and, and so I say, yeah, well, I'll do that. Of course I will. I'll, I'll try and I had a wonderful committee of professors, of key, key players of industry, researchers, 
some of the best teachers in the, in the British Isles and some children, of course. And the first thing we did was to say, it would be jolly helpful, wouldn't it, if we, know, if we knew what tomorrow looked like. So that's what we did. We read every white paper, we read every um, policy document, we read every um, hyperbole from every company, we read everything. And we looked at our own wisdom, our collective, something like 700 years of experience. And, and I can tell you now, this is what your schools look like in 2025. No doubts, no maybes. I've actually, interestingly enough, I've never been wrong in 26 years a professor, which is a nice thing to say. But the thing I'm, I'm never right about, of course, is the time frame. You can be very clear about what's going to happen, whether it happens quickly or slowly. Roll the dice. You know. But this is what it will look like. And our government said, Stephen, can we get there by 2020? That's in five years' time. So I wanted to unpack some of this for you because it impacts hugely on what you will do as a community as a culture, as a nation, with mobile, portable, pocketable devices and beyond. So the first thing, of course, is simple enough. It's just online learning will be an entitlement. And that's quite an interesting reflection. I was in, um, I was in Tasmania. I'm in, funny enough, I'm in Australia. Australia next week. I was in Dubai last week. I think I'm in Scotland on Sunday, you know, so the world, the world has gone learning mad, you know, but I was on a ferry in Australia and the, the nice man on the ferry, uh, and it wasn't a very big ferry to be honest, two cars, 12 people, it was his job to drive across the river and to drive back, he went back some forwards and he'd applied for a job crewing a super yacht in the Mediterranean. Just go down to the harbour, you can see the kind of thing he was dreaming of working on. And the interview was by Skype, and uh, he hadn't Skyped much, and he was pretty hopeless. He leant, he leant over the screen. They, they interviewed his chest mostly, I think. They didn't see much of his face. Um, he didn't get the questions very well. Uh, he made a complete mess of the whole thing, and as a result, he's still going back and forwards on the river, uh, on the ferry. And he explained to me that if only in his school, he'd done a little bit more working with others connectedly, he would have had that job. In Europe today, something like 170 million jobs from home, professional jobs. Your children can work anywhere in the world. They are literally just a mouse click from uh, the rest of the world. And nowadays, of course, they're just a smartphone in their hand away from those jobs. And of course, they're competing with the rest of the world for those employments. PISA, with all its faults, I'm, you know, been critical enough historically of PISA, but PISA now says, look, we're going to rank our, our regions, our nations by, from this year, children's ability to collaboratively problem solve. From 2017, from their ability to do that online with others, you won't be able to rank in PISA without mobile technology in your pocket. You won't even make it onto the test. So the world is changing really rapidly and it's not unreasonable to assume some dimension of online learning. Now what I mean by online learning, of course, is itself complex. Look, if I think about what did universities do when they got exciting new technologies? Do you remember, um, you'll remember Second Life? You know, this was, um, this is an American university, Delaware, who were given Second Life in a wonderful 3D environment, everybody's an avatar, you know. Look at what they reinvented with it, you know. There's some hideous lecture theatre with people all sitting in rows being talked to by a, a rather strange professor in green trousers, you know. Um, I think we can do better. I think online learning means way more than that. What sort of things can it mean? Let's take a look. Here's, um, here's a connected school. Here's, uh, here are some children in England. Um, working with schools in India. Hello, Namaste from India. Your teachers, Mrs. Morris and Mrs. Gradley, 
have asked me to answer your questions on India. But now is not really a good time. I'll see you again in Jaisalmer, a city nearby. See you. Yeah, and uh, and rather delightfully, of course, those children, um, you know, can't wait until he gets into his hotel and sits down. They can start asking these questions. He's on a camel. Uh, he knows their teacher's name. Uh, he's busy on a camel. That was brilliant. You know? And that's in a school, of course, where everything the children do is live online. This is Broadford Primary, one of thousands of schools around the world who use YouTube as their channel for celebration and exhibition. And you can see here that everything they do, look here, are, here are two little, um, little kids here. They're reading five little speckled frogs, no doubt today, World Book Day, they'll be dressed as speckled frogs and uh, you know, standing in front of a camera. And look, 50 people around the world have, have seen them reading. They've had 50 people in the audience for their, for their reading. Of course, it's motivating. Of course, it's seductive. Of course, it's connected. So, you know, the question for all of us, I guess, you know, and, and you've seen, um, you know, schools with those mystery Skype windows. Uh, you know, if I pop into, um, well, let's, let's go there. We're running all this live. We might as well pop in and take a look. Let's have, um, this will maybe get us there. So I pop off into Skype. Uh, you know, I can say, well, let me find, um, let me find a school in, oh, where do you want to go? Crikey. Find a school in Belgium. Why not? Uh, what age range do I want? Six to 14. And, and, uh, Straight away, here are all the teachers, you know, in schools connected to Skype, waiting to do that morning mystery Skype that you know, tens of thousands of schools are doing around the world every morning. You walk up to the screen, there's somebody sitting on the screen, you've no idea where they are, you have 20 questions to work it out. Question one, what time is it? <laughs> that would be helpful. You're not allowed to ask, where are you? Of course, you yeah. <laughs> Question two, what did you have for breakfast? That would be helpful. I don't know. A lot of pickled fish, you know, we're in Scandinavia. And uh, <laughs> reindeer, you know. <laughs> um, and so on, you know. And kids all over the world are doing this every morning. You know, they have um, on the walls of their classrooms maps saying, these are the people we've mystery Skyped with. These are the people we've tweeted to. You know, and they're tweeting and tweeting away, as, as you'll see in a minute right down the age range, you know. So the first thing in the ETAG thing really is very simple. It is only that um, online learning is an entitlement and you won't find an easier way of doing online learning than free through the devices that are in your children's pockets and hands and backpacks and satchels. I mean, an interesting question, a tough debate for you as trade unionists, as teachers, as parents, students, how much is an entitlement? I can't imagine the children in Catalonia going into the world of work or the world of, of um, citizenship or the world of parenting or the world, certainly the world of grandparenting. can't imagine them going in with less than, what, 10% of their learning habitually online with others. But if it was 20%, that's a day a week. And, you know, the implications for the size of your schools for the timetable, you know, take them away and debate them. All I'm saying to you is, that's what's going to happen. You know, you work out how it works. You know, it's, a, it's simple, isn't it? A lot of people picked up mobile phones and used them in their classes pretty quickly, and they use them for connectivity. Let's, let's have a look at them. Um, uh, let's go to here. Yeah. Uh, here's... Um, You know, typical, a typical classroom, typical country in the world. You can see so long ago they were still using Blackberries, gosh, you know. Um, and a laptop, a, a phone, a pad. Uh, they, how do those schools work out the rules of engagement for making phones safe? And the answer was, of course, they swapped with each other, they collaborated, they did what you did, they exchanged wisdoms. And they came up, really, with the same three simple rules, which I'd, I'd offer you as a jolly good starting point. Uh, rule number one, 
is if you bring your phone in, it will always be on the desk screen up. Simple thing. Phone under the desk is probably trouble. Phone on the desk screen up. Everybody can see what's going on. Very, very, very simple. I, I'm converting the education system in Silkeborg. I don't think I know a child there wouldn't come to school with their phone in their pockets. Certainly the same is true of my schools in Australia and elsewhere. Not that every school's done that, but many have. Second simple rule, if you bring it, be prepared to share it. And that opens such a simple solution to all those worries about privacy and me sexting pictures of my knees to you and you getting quite excited about it. Well, if I'm sharing the phone with my friends, you know, I can't bully, I can't do bad things. And also, I have to learn how to log out of Facebook and Twitter and I have to, you know, don't leave my, my private settings open. And the third simple rule is, and by the way, if I brought the thing, the least the school might do is give you things to do with them that are, that are worthwhile. So, you know, two things for the child, one thing for the school, and off we go, you know. And, and of course, you know, that connectivity, um, and we'll come to some more of these details in a minute, that connectivity is complex. Let's look at the complexity of writable surfaces for a moment, because, in a way, the writable surfaces have probably had more effect on schools around the world than anything I've seen in the last three or four, five years. Schools around the world are saying to children, write on the desks, write on the walls, write on the cupboards, write on the glass, write on the more glass, this is me in Madrid, write on huge walls. You know, children doing their entire coursework on the wall, not in an exercise book. Well, this brings us to the first important principle in all of this, which is everything I'm telling you is easy, but it is complex. There isn't just one thing. You don't just add phones or just add um, better furniture or just improve the lighting or just change the CO2 levels. Making learning better is a really complex thing. I'll come back to that in a minute. But one of the things we do know cognitively is that if you write on the board and children copy, we're all storytellers, is what we do as teachers. You know, I'm writing a story and, uh, you know, you arrive a little late and, you know, I make a point, I oh, you were late, you know, and I make a little thing about a little exclamation mark and underline your name, you know, and maybe there's a point you didn't quite get or somebody at the back was gazing out of the window, so I draw a little window around the important point to make the point that, oh, so you should really be looking at, um, at this. And my, my work is a story. Now, we know that if the children copy that down, several things happen. Fundamentally, the story doesn't stick in their minds. Nobel Prize for Science in the 1970s was given for that GPS of, of memory of how do we map things into our brains, and they, somebody re-won re the prize for revisiting that work again last year, and we know more, but we certainly don't think it's wrong. So when you want to remember things, you build these little taxonomies of understanding. 93% of the neurons in your brain do the housework of making sense of chaos, matching patterns, putting things together. Only 7% do the remembering. So if I copy from the board into my exercise book, the copy I've got doesn't remind me of the lesson. If I take out my phone and I take a picture, when I look at the picture, I remember the story, remember the window, remember Jose, remember you, come, oh, remember you coming in late. I remember all the details of what was going on. So we know that these are a key to children's better learning, just as a memory tool of just capturing images in that simple, simple, simple way. And because we can do that, it's easy to say to the children, as these architects are doing in Sydney, because this is how people work. Would you work on the walls? Would you work on the windows? They tried writing on my phone, it didn't work. Um, but would you work at what height? You know, would you work? This is Microsoft's headquarters in 
Seattle, they're writing on the walls too. Everybody's doing it. Here are young children doing it. Here's a school where before the exam, the children write their revision notes all over the school. So as they're coming up to their maths exam, they can't walk through a door without being reminded of what they want to know. Walls are for learning. And the key that's unlocked the door to walls for learning has been the device in your children's pockets. So this is a complex thing. It works. It works well. Um, and, and it allows us to do some clever things. So just saying at the start, first of all, online connected learning is an entitlement. Second, we're going to know a lot more about learning. And let's look at a few more details of the things we now know about learning. Some of it's quite scary. Um, I have a project running with some of my PhD um, students uh, where they're doing this. They're going around their schools using the phone in their pocket to measure the light levels, to measure the sound levels. There's light, there's sound, and to see where the best places are for learning. Um, folks, there are some seats still at the front here, and the expensive seats, the cheap seats are all gone. <laughs> uh, we'll just all come up here, there's comfy seats. <laughs> we have big screens, you know. <laughs> you may get questions later. But. And then when they've, when they've done that, they go off and they, they run around their school and they say, I wonder where the best places for learning in our school are. These are... Um, these are children in Catalonia, uh, and uh, they've measured the light levels, the sound levels, they've done sound comparatives, um, they've graphed, they've, me they've measured at 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, um, 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock. They've looked at the data, there's a lot of technology, a lot of science in this. They presented this, by the way, in London. This is why it's in English, not Catalonian. And they, they said to their teachers, how could you possibly teach us in a room where the, the peak level for sound goes up to 96 decibels? You, know, you can't work there. How can you help us if you're in a place like that? Sort your room out. And those children got very excited when they were looking at their stairwell, which was one of the noisiest places. You can see what's happening here. The girls are walking up and down the stairs using, in this case, tablets to measure the, to video their walking because uh, they're trying to invent a quieter way to walk and the lad at the top here is using the um, again a tablet this time to set the decibel levels and measure to see if they can invent a quieter way of walking which they did by the way they now I believe have a little raspberry pie on the stairwell which flashes red if you walk too noisily this is children using their mobile devices to make their learning better using their science and their understanding and, you know, and their ingenuity. Look, here's a, here's a group who found the noise of dragging their chairs was hugely intrusive. So the, how can we silence our chairs? And this is what they did. They put, they put silencers on the chairs, tennis balls. Very simple. Second-hand tennis balls. They spent no money, of course. You know. um, so, excitedly, kids are taking hold of that. But we've, we've found so much interest in all this. We've found other things as well that you can't measure on your phone. Here's the CO2 level in the classroom. And uh, we've been a bit alarmed by this. This is, uh, if you're still teaching in a traditional classroom with the door shut and 25, 30 children in the classroom. This is, this is what's happening to your children. Um, this is break, break, they go out and you can see that by break, the CO2 level is over 3,000 parts per million. At that point, you would begin to feel nausea. You're certainly not able to concentrate. You find it very hard to learn well. And CO2 is a heavy gas, it just kind of hangs around. The children go out for break, they come back, the gas is still there. So by the time you get to lunchtime, this is lunchtime in England, not in Spain. Uh, um, but, you know, they still go out and look at the peak, 4,000 parts per million. 
So throw in the light levels, which are desperately low. You know, if I looked at that, that light level, you could not teach a class of students in light levels that low. 250 lux. Load it up on your phones. If there are students, students in the room, load the lux meter on your phone. It's a free app. And measure the school and say, no, we can't learn in here anymore. It's not possible. Under 250 lux, you get out of the room. In prison in England, if the lux level gets below 50, they evacuate the prison because the prisoners are at risk of their health and the wardens are at risk of being, <laughs> being murdered in the dark. You know. and, um, and the same with noise, you know, anything over, anything over about 72 decibels. Well, I've been into examination rooms this year, found children trying to do exams with barely 50 lux. Unbelievable. They just put, they just improved the light. The kids would be doing five to eight percent better uh, straight away. Big research project just came out last week from an English university. 15 percent gains in learning just from improving light and ventilation levels. So this is key stuff. What I'm really saying to you is the details of how we learn, we know more about, and the tools in your students' hands are the tools you have to unlock that research and to find out more about it. But also, by the way, to have fun. Look, here's, um, you know how hard it is to get children succeeding with mathematics. Here are some of my schools around the world. We're desperate to increase numeracy. I've dressed the kids up as binary numbers and shout 27 or whatever at them. You know, we have number trees all around the school. Each branch on the tree has an algorithm. The kids have to work out why are the numbers on that branch. It could just be old and even, you know. Every pillar asks, how tall are you? There are no numbers on the buildings, on the rooms. There is no room nine. There is a room square root of 81. Work it out. Um, next door to it, by the way, is the atomic number for sodium. That's room 11, uh, and so on. So the whole place is a set of maths puzzles. And, of course, the kids are using maths when they're walking up and down stairs to learn language, to learn number. And they're using their mobile phones to walk around, in this case, the streets of Norwich in England and draw. Can you see they've drawn a Viking longship? That's supposed to be a boat. There's the sail. Here's the hull. They've drawn a boat on the streets of Norwich. Or perhaps more, um, more mathematically look at this... Um, group of students, they've just taken their phones out of their pocket, turned on the GPS trace, the challenge is go and draw a Christmas tree. That's really hard. When I, when, I, when I talk to the kids, these kids in Melbourne, when I talk to the kids in Melbourne, I said, you guys are, you gods, this is amazing what you've done. I mean, think how hard it is to do the angles, the scale, the estimating skills. They said, oh, no, mate, we, we stuffed up. I don't know how well stuffed up works in translation, but we're disappointed with our performance, I think. And I said, I said, why? They said, this line was a mistake. We didn't mean to do that line. We just got a bit lost. That was a, we really want to do it all over again. You know? So there's something in the, oh, and by the way, that's rather delightful. Those are linear equations. The linear equations generate the artwork. So this is maths and art working together to go forward in a way they never really did before, you know. So all I'm really saying at this stage, let's go back to our, um, our little, um, sorry, let's go back to our uh, little bit of government research. Here we are. And uh, all I'm really saying at this stage is we know an awful lot more about learning. And, but there's lots we don't know. I mean, I don't know anybody who has better food than Spain. Every time I come, I'm in... As you know, I'm in UCJC in Madrid. I'm a professor at the Philip Segovia Chair in, in Learning Innovation uh, in Madrid. And every time I eat with my colleagues, I put a fork in my mouth and I go, but this is delicious. Because I come from England where the food is poisonous, as you know. Um, I mean, it really is bad. You know. uh, I say, this is delicious. And they all say, but of course. you know. But just take that simple thing of the world's best nation at eating, and how many of your children do an exam 
every year. Oh, look, it's all of them. So what would be the best thing to eat on the morning of an exam? Look, this is quite interesting, isn't it? Because if I think about... Um, uh, if I think about um, maybe sport, you guys are pretty good at sport. Uh, great football here. Grand Prix drivers, some, uh, some pretty good sailors. I'm a, I'm a sailor. My family have Olympic medals. Um, you have great sailors. If, if I'm, if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm one of your 49er sailors, and I and I've got my race tomorrow, I know exactly what to have for breakfast today. Actually, I know what to have last week. Actually, I know what I'm supposed to have eaten for the last four years. And if today is the final, the medal race, I know that it's a slightly different diet to the diet I've had during the week, during the series. So I ask you simply, what would you eat to be best in the exam room? And do you know how much research there is about that worldwide? Um, none. There is none. There's lots of stuff on well-being. I know what I should do. There's lots of stuff on wellness. I know I'm too fat. I know, you know, that I'm trying to do something about it. But, um, you know, I know what foods I should and shouldn't eat. But, you know, if you were going into a multiple choice test at 11 o'clock tomorrow, your diet between here and then is pure guesswork. Maybe some fish. Maybe. But when would you eat it? About three weeks ago, I did. Maybe a banana for the potassium. Maybe. But it's not going to help you later today. At the moment, it looks as though some dried raisins covered in chocolate would be pretty good. This is, this is um, high cuisine in England, you know. <laughs> but actually, the chocolate would make you feel optimistic enough to do well in the exam, and the dried fruit might just see you through, you know. So, but isn't it extraordinary that we don't know something as simple as that? You know that that will change. So the next five years, things are going to change in your schools just because we know better how to do learning. And you'll need to be fleet of foot. But lastly, of course, in this list, and uh, how are we doing for time? We're okay, I think. But lastly, of course, the biggest change is about the ownership of technology. Now, I'm just trying to think if I've got here my very first um, computer that I put into a school. I'm not sure I, not sure I do have. I, I've certainly got some old computers here. Um, I opened in London, a part of a team of people who built the London Science Museum's Gallery of Modern Communications, and um, I didn't do the work, I just helped steer it, you know. Here's our queen. Um, she has a bouquet here made of punch tape and computer cards. It's quite unusual, really, for her. Um, she sent her first tweet. So, so with teachers in the audience, if you're not on Twitter every day, uh, you know, here's an 80-something-year-old woman who has somebody to butter her toast she's on Twitter, so be ashamed if you're not. Be ashamed. Um, sort it out tonight, please. Uh, but it's interesting looking back at the technology of many of our lifetimes, those old television sets, the, um, the telephones in hotels where people had to connect. I did, I'd made my first connection between a school and another school on a switchboard like this using a computer in, I think we were 1983, and we had a modem to modulate and demodulate, modem, the signal, so we could go down the phone lines. We were on the second floor, and I kind of made the connection on my ancient computer, pressed the space bar to connect, and of course it didn't connect because downstairs there was somebody who had to plug the wires in, you know, and um, she didn't know what to do, so we had somebody on the floor below me and somebody on the floor below them. When I hit the space bar, I stamped on the floor. The person on the floor and the stamp went down. She went, ah, that's them upstairs and plugged in the, the wire, you know. That was only in the 1980s. And by the way, it worked. I had, she, was, she had a very predictable delay. 
It always took her a moment to realize, oh, that took her exactly, you know, 13 seconds so I could write it into the code. You know. Or here's um, you know, telephones, you know, I, I had to buy one of these for my grandchildren so they could learn about dialing a number, which they love, you know, it's quite a skill not to have your finger come out or ringing somebody with that ringing noise. Or here's um, Google's first street view bicycle. Let's cycle around the world, take pictures of everybody's houses. It's quite a big world, Google. You know, you're going to need a car, I think. You know, but off they went. Here's um, Morse code. You know, sending messages in Morse. This is a this is a mobile phone um, shop from Cameroon. We brought the whole shop over to West London. Round the back of the shop, uh, this was the inside of the shop exactly as it was. And of course, the kids working in the shop are mashing up, repairing, making phones and bits of phones with an ingenuity. You know, if your kids aren't programming with Raspberry Pis, if you haven't built maker spaces in all your schools, if you haven't got space trips going, popping out of every village uh, on meteorological balloons this year, I don't know how you're going to keep up with the guys in Cameroon because they're doing this for a living between school days. And look, here's... Um, oh, I, I was a little... I was late buying my first Macintosh. I bought mine in 1985. This is a 1984 one, so that wow, you know. Um, here's the very first mouse, Doug Engelbart's wooden mouse. Doug only died in 2013. Here's... Um, this is interesting. This is the supercomputer that Russia was going to win the Cold War with. And um, this, this was turned off in 1997. I, I use um, an Apple iPhone 6 Plus, and this comfortably outperforms the supercomputer that was going to win the Cold War. So you've got kids coming to school with the supercomputer that was going to win the Cold War in their pockets, and some schools are saying, hang on a minute, I'm not sure if you should get it out or not. Well, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing to reach some agreement. Here's, um, look, before we had keyboards, the only keyboards we had were on harpsichords, so the keyboards had to be keyboards, you know. You played the keyboard like, uh, look, I'm not going to bore you with all this. That's the, um, the radio room from the Titanic, where that first memorable message was, we are sinking, send help. Uh, send help now, I think, was the message. And uh, as you know, many were saved. Leonardo DiCaprio wasn't saved, but <laughs> many others were. Um, I just wanted to make you think about the ambition. Look, here are some of those early portable devices. I think they thought this one would be great for kids. Look, it's funky. It looks kind of teenage. Kids will say, yeah, it looks rubbish. Can we have one that, can we have one that works, please? You know? <laughs> and of course, you know, that's what they got in droves and, uh, and so on and so forth. Just, think back to the ambition of the people who thought let's put a cable across the Atlantic you know you pick up your phone the very first time I said to a schoolgirl, here's a mobile phone and do you remember it was that big one with the aerial we saw at the beginning I put it down on a desk in a class and said what might you do with it and she said straight away she said you know what she said, I could phone up somebody in France and practice my French and learn some naughty words. I mean, she knew exactly what she wanted to do. And that was, you know, of course, it was only a quarter of a century ago. But um, these guys thought, let's build, let's put a cable across the Atlantic from Europe to America. Well, hang on a minute. We haven't got a cable that long. Don't worry. We'll invent it. We've got no way of sending... No, we've got no way of reading information that send down a cable that don't worry we'll invent the moving coil galvanometer with its mirrors and springs and wires then we'll know if there's even tiny bits of electricity coming down but we haven't got a boat big enough to carry the cable don't worry we'll build the biggest boat in the world oh we don't know what the bottom of the Atlantic is like we'll put a bit more cable in to be safe in case there are hilly bits you know and off they went and they didn't even know what message they were going to send when it first got there. First message, as you know, was, is it working? That wasn't the official first message. That was the technicians testing it, you know. 
How ambitious have we been with the learning we've got in front of us? And I think we've been hugely, hugely overcautious. Let's explore this a little. People talk about age with, um, with mobile technology. Let's have a look at um, some young folk. Here's, um, here's a couple of youngsters. This, um, this is, uh, here he is, this is, whoops, come back Chris, here he comes. This is Chris Espinosa. Chris Espinosa, as you can see, is Apple employee number eight. And uh, back in 1977. He's really cross about that number, still works for the company. Because he thinks he was employee number four. Well, he was employee number four. But he didn't get the number because Chris was still at school. He was only 14 at the time, and he only worked there at night. So did his schoolwork, went to the company, sat down. The day they gave out the numbers, he didn't arrive till 4 o'clock, so he got number eight. Um, have a look at this teenager's bedroom. Whose bedroom's that? That's Steve Jobs' bedroom. And uh, as a teenager. And those aren't pizza boxes. Of course, those were components of the kits of a computer. Or here's... Um, just to show I've got no great bias in all his Bill Gates at school, a young Bill Gates, and um, he's helping out with the school registration system so he can be in classes with more girls, basically, which is his dream. You know, <laughs> if I hack the system, there will be more girls in my class. And being geeky wasn't enough even then. Um, so, how young? A good question. At what age? should we be putting mobile technology into the hands of our children? You know, never mind, should the kids have them in the exam room? Yes, of course. Never mind, should they have them to record and capture all their work and all their writing so they don't waste time making bad copies? Well, of course. At what age should they be carrying the phones to do the science to make their learning better? Well, you've seen from, you know, eight or nine onwards, but how far down would we go? And it's an interesting Question, let's reflect a bit on a couple of things. Here's, here's me as a youngster, I'm very old. I was born in black and white, obviously. Uh, color only appeared on earth later, you know. Um, and, uh, and I'm learning to swim. I have this strange device here. I'm not sure what it is. It looks like come out of Madonna's bra, I think. But anyway, so they would put me in it and I would try and swim with it, you know. Um, None of us do that anymore. I mean, all of us do this. Here are my grandchildren swimming. Uh, Louis, I think, in this picture is two. Emily was four. This is their swimming club. You do this all over Spain. We do it all over England. Everybody does it. You throw the children in the water at about six months. And, you know, in a gentle way, you're there to be joyful and happy with them. But it turns out they could swim all along. They don't surface very They swim underwater. Um, so they... They drown, but that's, that's the only setback, you know. Um, you have to teach them to surface, and that's all. But these two are of an age to swim up to the photograph being taken for their swimming club and, uh, and wave to the camera. Here's Emily, you know, smiling to the camera. She's not quite two there, and so on. And when it comes to cycling, um, here's, um, here's a, a two-year-old sat on a bicycle for the first time. And look, they can balance. We, we know that, you know, children can innately cycle bicycles. They can't, they can't stop, but they can do other things. They can't pedal, but they can balance. But many of you will have been taught to ride a bicycle with stabilizers and a parent running alongside. So kind of what is the, what is the equivalent of the stabilizers on the phone? What's the equivalent of the armbands on the phone? And we've all been guilty, I think, of overprotecting children, and I'm saying to you, loud and clear, children should have phones before they start school. That's my view. And why would you not give them books and crayons and flowers and cardboard boxes and everything? Because you know what's happening cognitively in their minds of those early years. They're building taxonomies of understanding there. They're saying, you know what? I understand the difference between a tweet and a text message. And a look, let me show you. 
here is my granddaughter, Emily, and I made her the promise, one of a group of children we were, we were following, I made her the promise, Emily, the minute you can send me a text from your, mom, from your mother's phone, I will buy you a text and I will fund it. So immediately, she sent me this text. Now, <laughs> I see I didn't quite get the rules right, you know, <laughs> because it's not a very good text. But she did what I asked her to do, and I'm saying here to her mother, my daughter, I presume that was from Emily. Yes, so I bought her a phone, and uh, almost immediately, um, I start sending her bits of text. She sends me back selfies, her, and, and she's working through, she's only four at this point, of course, but she's, she's already starting to try and think around phonics, and she's excited um, by that experience, and you can see she is. Well, by the time she's five, um, she, we're having good conversations, and here she is at five, and she sent me a picture. Look, I'll just show you the picture for a moment. Here's the picture. She's very proud to tell me that she's doing 3D printing at school at five. Well, of course, she is. Um, and she can't wait to, to tell me about it. So she tells me this was made by a 3D printer. We always get kisses. And I say, wow. Um, I always used her full name for a long time. Um, and, uh, and I try to impress her then with a photograph of a hotel I'm in, which has a has a television set built into the bath. He's mercifully a set, not a picture of me in the bath, a picture of the television set. She's completely unimpressed by this, like TV. It's so old, granddad, you know. Um, so uh, she's forming in her mind some interesting, and she's starting to get her head around email. So here she is, still at five, and uh, she's now emailing to me using her phone for the uh, her iPad this time for the um, for the poem. She's sent me a poem where you can see it's her acrostic, the first letter spelled Grandad, uh, in a nice way. And um, and I'm pretty because she's still struggling with phonics, but I like phonics. It's going to come. Great rum, noisy days, delicious cuddles. Who could ask better, really? And you might then say, so you know, is this a girl who is now crazed by? the device in her hand as she become like all teenagers, you have to, absolutely not. She's a child who loves reading and of course, who has a young brother who can't wait to read because he knows when he can send me a text and I've changed the rules. The text has to make sense. So when he can send me a text, he will get a mobile phone. And um, meanwhile, of course, Emily is busy as a five-year-old tweeting. This is with all her classmates. This is a live Twitter feed running at the back of the church. Uh, they're having their harvest festival. She, who's she tweeting to? She's tweeting to God. And uh, I'm not sure if God's on Twitter, to be honest. There's an interesting philosophical debate there, I think. Probably, perhaps his son would be. But, um, but she's giving thanks for her books and her climbing frame and her families and her iPads and thanks for her food, which is what they're supposed to be giving thanks for a course in this example. So um, they're tweeting away. And now, of course, some years on, at seven, uh, you know, last year she was off to school. Um, it's World Book Day today, so she goes, goes off in the character of her favorite um, book heroine. And uh, last night, just last night, I noticed that she was chatting to the librarian in her school, it's an all-through school, um, about what she's going to wear. And, you know, so here's a seven-year-old talking to a librarian about who's your favourite character from literature, who you're going to come as, what you know. And by the way, the librarian saying to her, um, you know, this is Emily saying back, I'm going as Pippi Longstocking, what are you going to go as, uh, and so on. And look, it really doesn't get any better than this. Except maybe it does because we know now that babies can read from books, can see faces, can make sense of black and white and we're giving babies books at three months and those babies are, you know, going on to become great readers. This is one of my granddaughters and uh, she's, I guess, about 18 months away from getting a phone too. And, um, and meanwhile, the big kids, of course, are getting excited about things like... Um, 
Google Glasses as well, and, um, and Oculus Rift, and the little kids are getting excited about Google Cardboard and so on. What I'm saying to you is, as parents, as teachers, as politicians, surely we want our children at the earliest possible opportunity to work with us on sensible, careful use of pencils, of pens, of wood. You know, look, here's a, here's a simple little illustration from, um, from one of my schools. And uh, here you can see a young child and an older child learning to do woodwork. The, old, the older boy here, you can see, is guiding the saw. The older boy is 15. The younger boy is only five. He's guiding the saw. The boy's doing all, all the work. Can you see the teacher behind, by the way, who's reached around the child, is holding the saw around the wood, and is doing everything for them. So, you know, in a way, there's... Don't you use the technology, I'll use it for you. And here's... I'll show you how to use it safely. And you can see how relying on our other students... Here's my granddaughter standing on tiptoe, copying another boy who she's only just met, who's standing on tiptoe. She doesn't know why he's doing it, but she can see that it's something she might like to learn to do. So all I'm really saying to you is three things. One is, there is no too early. Go with them. Let me tell you that children who start early with these technologies are really happy to put them down. Emily and all the group in her research cohort will put their phones down for a week. They'll go on holiday without them happily. He'll totemize it, make it so special, fight with them until they're eight or nine, and you will not take it from their hands. And they'll put everything else aside, including their books for it. Trade with them. Trade with them passive viewing of television, which you do not want to encourage. A child sitting watching television streaming at them, rewarding their passivity, little hits of dopamine and, and, and maturity. Catastrophic, really. Whereas interactivity, communication, creativity, ingenuity, all those things right here in their hand. Give them a phone, give them, an, give them a, a sand timer. Say, if you've got the phone, there's a sand timer on top of the television set. Turn it over. You've got 40 minutes a day. When it's gone, it's gone. You know, use your teacher's brains. Use your parents' brains. Use your politicians' brains. Do what's best. Secondly, I'm taking you back to those kids in those schools all around the world. And let's, let's go beyond those kids. Let's go to kids, say, like these in, in Liberia, who actually oh, wasn't expecting them. They're quite interesting too, but um, maybe these kids. You know, these kids, you know who they are all over the world. These are child soldiers. They've walked out of school. They've picked up a gun. We can persuade them to come back into learning. There is nothing better in life than learning. Television is awash with learning. Your, your devices, your, you know, I turn on the television here. The people learning to dance, learning to sing in England, learning to cook, of course, we need it, learning to sew. You know, learning is the coolest thing on the planet. We can get these kids to put down their devices and come back into learning. But if the learning they come back into is a learning that tells them what they cannot do, they will pick up the devices and go straight back out and have more fun with the alternative. These are all images I've captured from around the world from people's schools. You know, children have to have an adult with them before they can use a computer. This is performing arts, but there's a special place for your bag. These are drums, but you're not allowed to bash them. I don't know what else you do with drums apart from bash them. Here's, um, sorry, here's um, uh, no mobile phones allowed. Please don't move the furniture. You, you can only come into the computer lab when you've been given a detention. Turn it off before, you know, every turned off device is a turned off child. I give you the absolute certainty of that. You know, and 
Oh, this is from America, of course. You can bring your guns in, but would you mind taking the ammunition out? But this is just ridiculous. It's a learning resource centre, but you're not allowed learning resources or must be turned off. And by the way, you can't cycle. There's no joy. Put that ball down. That's what the kids' response to this has been. And I just implore you as a group, make learning better. Use the stability you have as a community. Use the opportunity you have, the mutuality. Look at you all together here in this room. Use it. Use the wealth that you have. I know we don't feel very wealthy in Europe, but you should see the rest of the world. Use the investment we've made over the last 3,000 years in learning. Use it to make learning better, cheaper, more accessible, more delightful, more seductive, more playful, just plain better. Go away from here, take your resolve, mend the world with learning, and use these as your band-aids to make it better. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.